So if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you didn't bring your own Bible, grab a pew Bible, uh, Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. At the outset, I'll just read our text, and then we'll get into it. Hopefully this is a, a couple of verses that are fer- very familiar to you. Uh, maybe you haven't thought of them in this context that we will talk about today, so um, I, I hope and pray that this is a beneficial time for you. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So we begin this preaching series on Theology Matters In from a place that is uh, of fundamental importance. It is a place that spans across the rest of what we will discuss in this preaching series, like topics like Theology Matters in the Home, Theology Matters in Science, Theology Matters in Work, for example. Maybe you have heard of the term worldview. Maybe you haven't. What does it mean? Uh, What does it it encapsulate? Uh, Essentially, our worldview is the lens through which we see the world. So we think of glasses, the lens through which we see the world and the filter through which we understand the world. This view of the world captures all of life. So this term has often been expanded to world and life view. Now, before we move any further, I need to make a couple of connections uh, before I provide a couple more definitions. And I do this on purpose at this point. The first connection is that everyone is religious. Every single person, no matter who they are, what they believe, every single person is religious. Every single person has religious beliefs and functions on those religious beliefs as a basis for how they live and how they understand the world no matter who they are. Secondly, this topic of worldview has a direct connection with culture. Because our worldview, whether we realize it or not, directly affects how culture is shaped. We are individuals living in a collective society. And that dichotomy is very important to to understand. So the more I share a similar worldview that has similar foundational pillars with someone else, and the more that is multiplied, then often that society will reflect that prevailing majority of that worldview. So with this, it helps to recognize what culture is. Henry Van Til defined it with a simple, a great simple statement. He said, culture is religion externalized. And when we think about that, that's very, very true. Very true, and it's a very uh, amazing statement that we should be mindful of. Um, And it's a true statement that must be a part of this topic of worldview as we reflect on it. So keep that in your mind as we go on. And so as we begin to really understand what worldview is and how comprehensive it is, then we will see how it exists in every single person. Every single person. Everyone has a worldview that they operate from no matter who they are. Everyone has answers to all the issues of life. Everybody. The question is, where do these answers come from? And that's what makes up our worldview. With that said, I want to give a couple of definitions of what worldview is, but I want to do it from the perspective of unbelievers. Just so you see what I just mentioned, what I just talked about is actually very true. And I'll tell you why I do this. Again, it's because religious beliefs are underneath all of life. So Sigmund Freud defined worldview as, quote, an intellectual construction which solves all the problems of our existence uniformly on the basis of one overriding hypothesis, which accordingly leaves no question unanswered and which everything 
that interests us finds its fixed place. Interesting, isn't it? Notice the inherent religious basis when he says, worldview solves all the problems of our existence uniformly under the, on the basis of one overriding hypothesis. A professor at Oregon State University says this, quote, a worldview is the set of beliefs about fundamental aspects of reality that ground and influence all one's perceiving, thinking, knowing, and doing. Then he gives seven fundamental elements that exist in our worldview, which are epistemology. That is beliefs about nature and sources of knowledge. Then there's metaphysics, beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality. Then cosmology, based on beliefs about the origins and nature of the universe, life, and especially man. Then teleology, beliefs about the meaning and purpose of the universe, its inanimate elements and its inhabitants. Then there's theology, beliefs about the existence and nature of God. Then anthropology, beliefs about the nature and purpose of man in general, and oneself in particular. Then axiology, beliefs about the nature of value, what is good and bad, and what is right and wrong. Each of these subsets, as he says, of your worldview, each of these elements are highly interrelated with and affects virtually all of the others. Interesting statements. Now, when a Christian hears those elements, those seven elements that he brought out, we ought to immediately recognize that all of those elements fall under the heading of theology. Why? And this is where our presuppositions should lie, because everyone knows that God exists, every single person. And in him in God, we live and move and have our being, which shows that we are made for him. But in our sin, we replace him with an idol that is corrupted, that is the corrupted source of all of these elements that he mentioned of how we view this life and this world as we exist in it. But everything is in reference to him. <clears throat> everything, no matter what. St. Augustine said so brilliantly and to this point, he said this, quote, you have created us for yourself and our heart is not quiet until it rests in you. So all of these questions that we face in life come from a place that is either from God or not from God. So the important question then comes, who or what is the source of our worldview? How do we see understand and live in this life. If, we've, if we profess to be a Christian, then our worldview needs to be increasingly reforming itself to our ultimate authority. And who is that? God and his word. Our need is and our goal should be to answer every, and I mean every issue of life biblically and consistently. As those live alive in Christ, we should be proactive in, in this endeavor. We should be deliberate, uh, deliberate to formulate, to cultivate a, a, a comprehensive, consistent, biblical worldview as we live in this life. Because we know that God is at work within us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So this is a fundamental reality of our existence as Christians. At the very foundation uh, the major issues we face should be clear-cut. And then as those trickle down from those essentials, those, those basic fundamental issues, as they trickle down into the details of life, then we ought to see a progression toward what our text says. And we'll get into our text pretty soon. Now, the obvious must be stated, though. Unfortunately, we need to state this, but the obvious must be stated. We are not talking about perfection. Our worldview, this side of heaven, will never be perfect. Never be. Formulating a worldview from a Christian worldview perspective is a lifelong process that is under that governance and work of God in the process of what is called sanctification. Him growing us, conforming us to the image of his son. 
from day one, from salvation, from that new life, all the way to when we die and enter glory with him. We are sinners and we all have blind spots. We all have imperfections. We all have misses this side of heaven. But that should in no way be a cop out for us. To say that this is irrelevant or, or not important. It shouldn't be a cop out exempting us from the need of a full and intentionally biblical worldview. And if, if we know of anything that's going on right now, we need this so, so much. Sanctification is God, by his spirit, conforming us to the image of Christ and not the image of the world. So sanctification is a consistent renewal in righteousness and holiness worked out by God, by his grace, sovereign grace. That will naturally affect our worldview when God is at work in us. It will affect how we live, how we navigate this world, how we understand everything going, that's going on around us, how we see it. We should think of it this way. In our salvation, two worlds have crashed into each other. And the old world, the old life that constituted our unbelief is now progressively crushed by our new way of life as sanctification, as that process begins right away. So this new life is a life that is by nature not of this world. It's of God. Therefore, life in this world is lived out, from, uh, out differently, from a different way of thinking, a different way of understanding. It's fundamental, fundamentally against this world. And so as, as that new life, that new world crashes in and re replaces the old one, in salvation, it also progressively replaces the old one in sanctification. That is the reality of our situation when we are alive in Christ. And that should be the progression of our situation as we live in Christ. Actively living in Christ, which feeds directly into our worldview. Directly into how we understand this world. So let's see how uh, this text speaks to that grand topic of worldview as we pull it apart a bit and take note of a couple of aspects. So Romans 12, 1 through 2, I'll, I'll read it again. I appeal, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So first we need to note that what Paul says here, which is what God says by the Spirit through Paul, is not only an exhortation, an appeal to believers as an encouraging call to them, it is further a command a command to act that has a gravity to it where it, it's not optional. It's not optional for us. This is to enliven a passion for a life under the lordship of Christ. And at the same time, it is a command to obey him under his lordship. Both aspects, when acted upon by the grace of God, come from a genuine desire to live for Christ in all areas of life, every single one of them. He is Lord over all of my life. And so in that, we strive with a great desire to do the will of God. The exhortation or appeal is for believers to present their life in all of life as a life for God, like an offering where we offer up our lives, as Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the Spirit in the Son of, or by, by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is a framework that shapes our worldview, that is, that is a worldview that honors God, because it seeks to continually obey God, submit to him and his word, his authority. It is a view of life that encompasses all of life that is turned toward God. Because for one, by God's grace, we have been turned toward God in salvation, right? We're no longer turned away from him 
We're no longer in rebellion of him going our wrong way. But he has turned us by his, by his grace into salvation and now we are turned toward him. So this worldview is the outgrowth of our salvation that is a service rendered to God, which is worship. Now, as we see the concept of worldview in this text and the nature of humanity that is made for God, but has rebelled against him, we can see that uh, that worldview is worship, whether it is from a believer or an unbeliever. Every form of worldview from an unbeliever is an act of worship, idol worship to be exact, turned inward towards self, self-will. This is largely a foreign concept for the modern church. We think that the atheist, the humanist, the secularist are not religious and do not worship. We think that somehow there is a secular world out there that exists apart from God where people and their beliefs that govern all of their life are in some type of sort of limbo, a neutrality. But it doesn't exist. Instead, in reality, the unbelieving life that is presented is not a service that is rendered to God, but to the God of this world as a service to him. We are either for God or against God. It's plain and clear in Scripture. There's no neutrality at all. It is one or the other. There is no in-between, and if we look closely, understanding what worldview is, it shows us that. For the Christian, the reality is that we are commanded, commanded to cultivate a biblical worldview. We are commanded to grow in having a comprehensive Though not perfect this side of heaven, but a comprehensive view of life in all of its aspects. Every single thing. It is not a suggestion that some can take if they want. This is a command directly from God. It is a command to be deliberate in this endeavor. And the benefit of this for us is unimaginable. And that's known, understanding this unimaginable beautiful benefit is known as we grow and as we find consistency with the word of God and submit to his lordship even more in an active way. The command first comes in the negative. Do not be conformed to this world. More fully, this means to not be molded or fashioned to the image of the world or to the spirit of the age in this world in the time that you live. This negative shows us the pull of the world that comes at us, enticing us to be like it, to think like it, to look like it, to act like it, to love like it, to worship like it. This exposes the war that we face on a daily basis that is to be taken seriously, very, very seriously, which means that the deliberate formulation of a biblical worldview is a serious thing and a necessary thing. And when we understand that and live in that by God's grace, it is a joyous thing. Because we see more the reality of this world through the lens of God through his word. And we come to find greater comfort, greater peace, greater confidence in all the things that we face. But a reality is, is the enemy specializes in distracting, trying to distract us and especially the unbelieving mind on the things of the world. And that's where the unbelieving worldview grows in its worship. So we, as Christians, actively fight against that because that's not who we are anymore. We don't serve and worship the God of this world anymore. We have been redeemed. We have been transferred into the kingdom of light. And we have a king who reigns over us and works within us by his grace. So the believer is to work against that, that distracting uh, work attack of the enemy. And doing so intentionally in developing their worldview that, again, is to be biblical and consistent. 
The positive command that follows is to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This word transform is the the root of the English term metamorphosis, which signifies what the Spirit of God does in sanctification, and the command shows that we are alive in that process. When He's actually refining us, we're actually living, breathing, thinking, desiring, active in our life. And in the new life, we have the ability to obey and disobey. That is a reality of sanctification. And so the command goes out for us to obey Christ, to obey all of what God has commanded us. So as God moves us to obedience, we experience the blessings of the Spirit transforming us, changing us daily. And it is by the renewal of the mind that this is done. The mind is God's way to get to the heart. The aspect of the mind that is highlighted here is the reflective thinking. The reflective, meditating thinking that tests and has the ability to discern what the will of God is. Right? That's the result. That's the objective is to know what the the perfect, acceptable, and good will of God is. Right? This is where the great importance of sound theology comes in. Theology deeply, deeply matters in worldview. So here's a question, what is theology? Theo is God, ology is the study of. So theology is simply the study of God. This is a science done through the mind because God has chosen to reveal himself and his will in his revealed will called special revelation, scripture. And this comes to us in words, sentences, passages, books, that are all teaching from God himself. But just because we may study God's word in some respect, an active and God-honoring worldview can only happen by the work of the Spirit, by the work of the Holy Spirit in giving us an understanding of what God has said and in giving us an ability to apply his truth to our life in this world, to everyday life every mundane thing in life, no matter what it is. If truth doesn't go from the mind to the heart and affect the heart, which affects life itself, then that is an evidence that, as James says, our faith is dead. So fundamentally, our theological understanding that God brings to life within us has a great, tremendous deal to do with whether or not our worldview is active, biblical, and honors God. Just like everyone has a worldview that they operate from, that has answers to life's questions, everyone is a theologian as well. Everyone has thoughts and beliefs about who God is and what his will is. Every single person. The question is, like with worldview, is the theologian in their theology Christian? First of all, Second of all, is it biblical? This issue is directly connected to proving what the good, acceptable, perfect will of God is, which only those who have the Spirit dwelling within them can actually accomplish, can actually do. This further has to do with the will or desire and plan of God in more of a specific way that applies to life. This has everything to do first with who God is. Without knowing who God is, we will not know what his will is. What also contributes to this is knowing who we are as sinners. Because God is dealing with the judgment and salvation of sinful man through his son, Jesus Christ. So these aspects of who God is in the Trinity, in each person, in their nature, in their plan, in their work, in who we are in our nature, in our work or lack of, in what judgment and salvation are all about, in what God's law is and why it exists. Also with basic truth like God created male and female. God ordained man and woman to become one flesh. And there is only one race come from Adam and Eve. God defines what is good, right, and true. God is judge, ruler, and authority over all. And there's objective truth 
Absolute standards for truth, morality, and justice, and the like. These are all funda- fundamental and foundational to a biblical worldview, undergirding the whole thing. From there, our understanding of the nature and work of the church, its government and structure, is crucial. Our understanding of the nature and work of the whole, its government there and structure, is crucial. Our understanding of the nature and work of the civil government and society, its government and structure, all of this is essential to proving what the will of God is, which is worldview. Then we go on and on. We can go on and on in all the details that trickle down from all of those categories. That's why this study of the attributes of God is so important. That's why systematic theology is so important. That's why hermeneutics is so important. That's why church history is so important. These are all so fundamental to our life as Christians. So all of these issues trickle down to all subcategories and feed into our life. So do we see how much goes into worldview? Do we see how how big and massive and important of a topic this is? Now listen how clearly God speaks a worldview in this passage. Ephesians 5, 6 through 17. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the world, in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to think of or speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says... Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you hear worldview in there? All the way through it. It's embedded in basically every statement. Now, notice the worldview and the theological basis from these different statements. Hopefully you are aware of the Bill C-4 in Canada that was recently passed that says this. Conversion therapy causes harm because it is based on and propagates myth and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality is to be preferred over others. In light of those harms, it is important to discourage and denounce the provision of conversion therapy in order to protect the human dignity and equality of all Canadians. You hear worldview in there? Sure hope you do. Listen to these other statements. One congressman had said not too long ago, what any religious tradition describes as God's will is of no concern of this Congress. For those who are here this morning, Do you hear this again? Joe Biden, in his recent State of the Union address, said this, I said last year, especially to our younger transgender Americans, I will always have your back as your president so you can be yourself and reach your God-given potential. You hear worldview in there? You bet you do. Walt Disney. Oh, no, he wouldn't have worldview, would he? Yeah, he does. Mickey Mouse is to me a symbol of independence. He is a means to an end. He also said this, I love Mickey Mouse more than any woman I have ever known. That's worldview, right? Do you hear it? (coughs) Bill Gates, I think it makes sense to believe in God, but exactly what decision in your life you make differently because of it, I don't know. Your worldview in there? The Jimi Hendrix. Music is my religion. Uh, There's some worldview. Elon Musk. The future of humanity is going to bifurcate in two directions. 
Either it's going to become multi-planetary, or it's going to remain confined to one planet, and eventually there's going to be an extinction event. <coughs> That's worldview, and he's a theologian. Just not a Christian one or a good one at all. In anything that is said by anybody, you can see how it comes from what they think is true about life. How they answer the questions of life. Our worldview is embedded in everything. Absolutely everything we think, say, and do. And has a religious foundation underneath it. And it is culturally significant. Big time. So I come back to what St. Augustine said. You have created us for yourself, and our heart is not quiet until it rests in you. And when we understand these fundamental aspects of worldview that we talked about today, then we ought to recognize the chaos that is in, inherent in the unbelieving worldview and the effect that that has on societal life. Where there is agreement with what God has said, as it is lived out in life, then there is order. So the opposite of order is chaos. And when we think that all sin in unbelief is lawlessness, then the unbelieving worldview is what? Rebellion. It's rebellion at the fundamental core of it. Further, it is very clear that our worldview affects every minute of our daily life. So the more someone is active in a worldview that is anti-God, in all the fundamental areas that we talked about today, then it will have an automatic effect on society. Whether it's in their home, or anywhere else, their job, anywhere no matter where. And the more those worldviews complement each other in unbelief, chaos, and rebellion, then the more that that society will externalize that. Culture, religion externalized. Worldview undergirding all of it. This is why the intentional cultivation of a biblical worldview from Christians individually and collectively is so, so important in our lives. This is a fountain that pours forth from the living water that we have in Christ. This is that abundant life pouring out as God's Spirit works within us to know what God's will is for our life. This is bearing fruit. This is being rooted in Christ, established in the faith, just as we were taught so that we see to it that no one takes us captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Because in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2. Beginning of Colossians 2. Everyone has a worldview that they operate from. Everyone has answers to all the issues of life. Where do those answers come from? Where those answers come from develops our worldview. So sound, biblical, systematic theology matters a whole lot. It's a way in which God nourishes us and brings us out to live in the world that he has placed us in and live as we're not of this world, but living in this world. There's so much of scripture that applies to this, this, this truth of what worldview is. And if we don't have Christ as Lord, living under his lordship, then we're going to be going off on tangents that are so encapsulated in the world and the world pulling at us, do we really want that? We ought to strive, deliberately strive, with a desire that is produced by God to cultivate a biblical, intentionally biblical and consistent worldview. And right now, this is such a crucial, crucial subject. So with that, 